Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of South Asia Research Center, Soka University, Japan, I warmly welcome you all to this symposium organized by SARC. I'm Ui Teramoto, and I am a member of SARC and will be your MC today. I'm very sorry, first of all, to uh, keep you waiting, but we will start the symposium now. Today we have a special symposium entitled to Surviving in Global Village. It is an important topic as all of us are aware of, and we invited specialists from different views. I, please allow me to introduce our guest panelists for today's event. Firstly, I'd like to welcome Professor Mukesh Williams, who's uh, advisor to South Asia Research Center, Soka University, and has been teaching literature um, in Japan. Previously, he taught in St. Stephen's College for uh, many decades and co-authored a book uh, representing India, Literature, Politics and Identities, published by Oxford University Press in 2008, together with our other distinguished guests today, Dr. Rohit Wanchu. Dr. Rohit Wanchu, who is the head of the School of Liberal Arts and Human Sciences, Oral University, India. Welcome, Professor Wanchu, and thank you very much for being here together with us. He is a renowned scholar in history of India, and it is our honor to have him today. He's taught more than three decades apart from his publications. Um, he taught more than three decades at prestigious St. Stephen's College in Delhi. And I believe he has also taught the history of India to Soka University students who, um, who visited <laughs> India for three weeks program. I would also like to warmly invite another guest of ours today, Mr. Edward Levinson. Mr. Levinson was born in 1953 in Virginia, USA and came to live in Japan in 1979. That was a time when Japan went through rapid economic growth, I believe, and many he has captured many themes of Japan's daily life, and he's a very well-known photographer, writer, and a poet. And particularly, he's known for his pinfall photography. If you, uh, there is a wonderful website um, where you can see his pictures, pinhole pictures, and other short films. He's also received an award for his photo books titled as Timescapes Japan in 2006. So we have uh, today a wonderful panelist who has insights on literature, history, and life in Japan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Rebinson, for being here with us today. So without further ado, let us begin the, the symposium. I hope all of you enjoy this very special symposium. So firstly, I'd like to invite Professor Mukesh Williams to talk on the theme. Professor Williams, over to you. <clears throat> Thank you very much for inviting me to speak. <clears throat> on the topic of surviving in a global village. Uh, I, wouldn't go <clears throat> I wouldn't go into detail of thanking everybody, <clears throat> but definitely uh, Professor Sharma is here. Thank you for joining. And uh, <clears throat> uh, Professor Malcolm is here. Thank you for joining. <clears throat> and all the wonderful guests and my friends. <clears throat> so without much ado, let me begin. 
uh, I am confused, tired, but still alive. I think this sums up surviving in a global village. It came up when I was seeing things. Uh, there's an echo. But yes, sir, <laughs> let me ask one to sensei to mute this device. Yes, please yes. continue. So <clears throat> how do we survive in a global village? COVID has created an enormous loss of life and has brought our global economy to a near standstill. These are the two important facts. But these losses have also created opportunities for survival <clears throat> and a better future. Today, most of our resources are self-generated except for the vaccine. We depend on ourselves more and more. <clears throat> we need a bottoms up survival that begins with environmental governance. It's a kind of a gut feeling. <clears throat> it means to reshape policy rules, norms, human behavior and the collective involvement to decide strategies as far as possible. Some nations are integrating indigenous knowledge into nature-based solutions. For governments, building back <clears throat> implies using new technologies, sustainable, innovative solutions. So these are the ways which also hide indigenous knowledge, practices that form the base of nature solutions. I would cut on the background because it would definitely become long, but in the last two years, we have reinvented ourselves, family, workplace, personal life, and those who haven't are facing problems. So the pandemic has exposed health vulnerability, environmental disruptions, restrictions on travel, new hygiene practices, seclusion from friends and relatives have created new inconveniences. Managing the stress level of children and parents are new issues. Many Japanese schools, uh, the children have not seen their friends for nearly two years. And the school is concerned how to remove their masks so that they can recognize. Sometimes when the masks are removed, children begin to cry. <clears throat> so recognizing faces also the threat of a heat stroke if you put on a mask are really real things. So managing the stress level of children is, is very important. Sometimes they don't realize that they are falling sick. We also have realized that we cannot live in isolation. We cannot just perform activities in our mind as we used to do and forget about others. We need others for very ordinary things conduct conversation, help us in an emergency, explain what's happening at the airport in our neighborhood, who's being taken by, by an ambulance. <clears throat> These are simple needs, but at times become very extraordinary. <clears throat> so we don't need just a short-term economic recovery of GDP but a long-term vision of sustainable life for the environment, the flora and the fauna. We have to ask how many plants have been planted, how many trees have been planted. <clears throat> Are we aware of carbon sinks? The efforts 
countries are making, do we evaluate, are they paid for what work they are doing? I will not talk about the background of where these ideas come from, especially <clears throat> the global village that everybody knows. Maybe Rohit would talk about that, the Gutenberg galaxy. But all is not well. Um, today, Japan is using the knowledge that they have gathered about trees, for example, how they share water and nutrients and send distress signals when there's a drought or disease and how this can be used to manage the environment, how to create a global consciousness and not just use technology. <clears throat> the shift from the city to the rural area has increased in Japan. So what is our post-pandemic future? It looks rather bleak. Asian countries should collaborate to pool good practices from indigenous knowledge, create eco-resurgence. One more time, eco-resurgence, eco-sustainability. So at the local level to recognize the link between local resources and people's livelihood, they are connected to each other. And over dependence of local e economy on global production or what is called supply chains, you shouldn't go and buy everything from the shop, can lead to a negative impact on livelihood. We have small shops here, which have nobody there. And the farmers shops and they, you can buy anything for 100 yen. And I go, increasingly I go there to support them and buy and they support me with the goods that I get. <clears throat> so local economy should not depend too much on global production. Bhutan has this very interesting thing in case of how it measures gross national happiness, not GDP, which means teach about the value of culture, nature, protection of the environment, harmony. These are the issues that are very important. Sustainable life. What is sustainability? This is a buzzword. It means a wise use of resources and recycling things. We have gotten into that era of recycling things. Therefore, it means to meet our social, environmental and economic needs without compromising the needs of the future generation. Last year, Japan Spotlight asked me to write an article on the good things about Olympics that happened in Tokyo. Everybody talked about the bad things and I don't know why I agreed to write about the good things. And it was really, really difficult, but finally I got things together and I realized that the Olympic games was based on the concept of recycling. So from the venues and the podiums to the, to the uniforms and the medals, all were recycled. The Olympic village itself was built on reclaimed land. The beds at the Olympic village were made from reinforced cardboard, which will be recycled or which have been recycled after the games. The 5,000 Olympic medals were molded from precious metals extracted from electronic gadgets. So many people donated their used electronic devices such as old mobiles for this purpose. So during the two years donation campaign, 78,900 tons of such devices were collected. So there were many more things, I don't want to bother you with that, but the Olympics had five sustainable 
development goals. <clears throat> and that was zero carbon emission, zero waste, supporting nature, upholding human rights, and cooperating with all. Its motto was, idea was, be better together for the planet and the people. So this was pushing sustainable development. <clears throat> the other thing I want to talk about, which is also there on the net in the article, that the Olympics created what is called a Japanese hydrogen society that can become fully sustainable. So for the first time, hydrogen fuel was used to light the Olympic torch and the cauldrons. The cars were hydrogen. The electric generation was hydrogen. So hydrogen fuel is seen as, an, uh, as, as a wonder fuel. It has no carbon emission and can be produced through solar, solar energy. So there is a national hydrogen strategy in Japan, which will turn Tokyo and other cities into a hydrogen city. And uh, this will create what the Japanese call uh, tradition and modernity coming together. <clears throat> they will not do away with tradition. So all the dorms, cafes, gyms for the 11,000 athletes all were connected to hydrogen. So that's the, 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 the new concept of sustainable urban environmental development. The next thing I want to talk about, I'm speeding through, is the concept of Satoyama. This is a return of the Japanese concept of Satoyama, which means that mountains and arable flatlands come together in the old wisdom. So how to, basically Sato means village and Yama means mountain. So for agricultural and forestry use, so, for example, they use fallen leaves from the forest and uh, place it in their garden or in their farmland to create good manure. I have done it as well, and the plants are growing really well. <laughs> you don't throw away the leaves. So, during the Edo, fallen leaves in forests were used as fertilizers, wood for construction, uh, cooking and heating. So, kind of mixed community forest landscape for agriculture merged. <clears throat> so Satoyama is, is now used as what is called environmental harmony, sustainable living. This is indigenous process. I mean, China was also doing sustainability, but I don't want to go in detail into these things. Global communication, new areas of study have emerged. <clears throat> through digital technology, communication design, which is quite visible in our daily life. The creation of video communication, online slogans, figures in the media, the introduction of false information, new, new pictorial layouts, all point to a ubiquitous presence of communication design. Some of my friends are teaching communication design and Ed will tell you about these things how it is done. <clears throat> so there are a lot of uh, suggestions, but I would leave that. So new communication technology during the pandemic, it has also brought problems. The psychological implications of communication technology, um, what the computer experts can do and what they cannot. The increasing use of visual communication, creating more stress and physical ailments. It has led to the loss of old networks and old lifestyles. In Japan, you would be surprised that the world has become very, very unnatural, emotionless. And the disruptive forces of the world, such as emerging markets, technological change, aging world, globalization, deglobalization, have acquired a new urgency. There is a Japanese film director called Chie Hayakawa. She has introduced a new movie uh, called 
Plan 75. The plan calls for anyone over 75 to sign with the government, receive a sum of money in return for agreeing to be euthanized, to die. You could even go to a restaurant to have free dinners. The plan is full of goodwill and friendliness and pragmatism. But it is very cruel and very shameful. So I talked with Professor Sharma. He says, this is Kalyu, the new age. And I think he's right. <clears throat> so these disruptive forces have made the greatest changes in global economy that the world has ever seen before. Compared with the Industrial Revolution, the changes are happening 10 times faster, or maybe 30 times uh, to the scale of 3,000 in terms of impact. So these are not ordinary disruptions. Uh, how much time do I have? Um, so you have a couple of minutes left. Couple of minutes, okay. Uh, I would not talk about the pedagogy of learning then. And uh, uh, there is a book by Rogers. He said, he said that teleconferencing is doing something very interesting. It's a substitute for traveling. Instead of moving people to ideas, telecommunication is moving ideas to people. And this new idea stretches your nerves into the environment and makes you sick. You are working very hard and working more than ever before and you don't realize that you are doing it. At the same time, you feel, oh, this is wow, very nice because people with different opinions, beliefs, and upbringings interact, come together, and try to solve specific problems. The secluded world of learning has become a thriving marketplace. So the demand for international education worldwide will grow from 1.2 million in 2000 to 7.2 in 2025. So universities are rushing to acquire world-class recognition and higher global ranking. They are not so much interested in teaching or developing skills, but in ranking. Uh, capacity building rather than, basically they don't build capacity, they build status. Status building is more important. Uh, well, Hannah Arendt, a philosopher, uh, mentioned that we need an ethics of responsibility. These days, when we see an accident, we take a video instead of helping the victim. She said, we need, we need three kinds of responsibilities. Responsibility towards ourselves through our actions. Second, responsibility to judge by engaging with others. And thirdly, responsibility to care for the plurality of public space that makes up our world. He says our actions must match our words. Actions must match our words. So this is the world that we see today and um, this is also the theme of our conference where we would talk about the family i have not mentioned about the family because that would be the theme of the third international conference uh, of south asia which will focus on the new human family global and local one of my philosophy friends who retired i asked him i said what do you think he said well there is no family, all are dysfunctional. Um, well, well, that's his, his perspective. So with that, I come to the end of my presentation. Since there is not much time, I deleted a lot of stuff. And I hope it connected most of the things I wanted to say, and it made some meaning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Williams, for sharing a vast knowledge of what is, what is at stake in Japanese society today.
Professor Williams suggested how to um, how Japan take took initiative, political initiative for um, environmental coexistence. He also mentioned about the rapidly aging population and how political uh, decision is made using pl Plan 75, which is rather scary. Um, he also mentioned communication and other new uh, as new aspects that is emerging in Japanese society today. I'm sure we have a uh, you have a lot of interesting topic to share with us, which I will have to ask you to share with us later on during the Q&A session. Next, I'd like to invite Dr. Rohit Wanchu to the panel. Professor Wanchu? Ah, thank you. Can you, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you very well, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, what, what I would like to uh, uh, take up is this whole question of the global village and when this globalization emerged. Uh, it is not new. There was globalization when the empires colonized most of the world. And it led to the large scale movement of people uh, to work in plantations as slaves or as indentured workers in many parts of uh, Asia, mostly Africa and even uh, northern parts of Latin America. So, you know, the movement of people, of capital and of commodities is not new. The consequences for people who lived through that period were also very severe. And our current crisis should not blind us uh, to the fact that that particular harrowing experience for many people in the world is uh, still fresh in their memory, in their literature, and in several monuments that are still around. The present phase of globalization, however, is much more intensive at one level with enormous global supply chains affecting output consumption and the allocation of resources in different countries. It is, however, a different form of globalization, which a lot of people have commented about, which is that capital now moves much more freely than ever before. You can send millions of dollars with a click of a mouse, but for movement of people, or of labor, the 19th century, despite its restrictions and its oppressive nature, allowed for more physical movement. There were large scale migrations from Europe to the United States and large scale movement of people from uh, countries like India to places like Mauritius, Fiji, uh, Suriname and so on. But now it is very difficult to do so. The problem of the Syrian refugees is very different from that of the Irish who fled from the 19th century potato famine to the United States. The uh, restriction on the movement of people today has its own logic. One economist argued that the 19th century United States needed a supply of cheap labor. But right now, the concern is with skilled labor. So the migrations that take place today are those of elite, professional, highly qualified people. So that people, as Saskia Sassen had argued, 
uh, in Bangalore might have more in common with people in New York than they might have with the poorer people within 20 miles of their place of work. So the world has changed and different kinds of linkages have been established which are not going to disappear in the short run because they are the interdependent economy uh, today is so substantial that it cannot be dismantled very easily, nor does it make much sense from the economist's point of view or the corporate manager's point of view to dismantle it. After all, uh, you have huge companies uh, like Google uh, and nobody is talking about monopolistic control as they were in the late 19th and early 20th century United States when they talked about trust busting and the breaking up of companies like Standard Oil. So we live in a different period when technological prowess is now much more scientifically justified and socially acceptable uh, because there seems to be no real intellectual alternative to it. The other point that needs to be addressed is that uh, it is not just a question of globalization, it's also a question of population of the uh, age uh, composition of the population. If the population of the world hadn't doubled so much, then the achievement of millennium development goals would be far easier. There would be much less pressure on the environment and pollution levels would be much lower. But that of course is something that will take a long time and different parts of the world are in different periods of transition. For instance, uh, in India, we are supposed to be enjoying a demographic dividend, which is a young population and uh, capable of helping the economy to grow. Uh, in China, by comparison, they have a much smaller population of young people because of the of the one child policy over a period of time. So there are demographic and other factors which explain the nature of our current predicament uh, in terms of handling issues of economic development and sustainable uh, development. One of the other issues is that, uh, you know, the uh, world today is uh, greatly affected by the trauma of COVID-19 and subsequent variants. And uh, there are thinkers like Yuval Harari and many others who think that the world is going to be, uh, you know, dominated by authoritarian governments which are trying to regulate uh, the lives of people and certainly monitoring them through various uh, surreptitious means, including uh, the Pegasus software, which uh, was a matter of great international controversy. However, on the other side, one has to look at the, uh, the other side of technology. It reminds me of the kind of essays that uh, many of us had to write in school about the merits and demerits uh, of scientific progress or whether science was a curse or a blessing. Uh, it is probably both. And uh, we play a big role in deciding whether it is going to be a curse or a blessing. So the technological possibilities of the means of mass communication have some positive side as well. After all, it would not have been possible at any stage in history for something like WikiLeaks to happen. Uh, and so uh, there is uh, the possibility of people not only having enormous 
methods for surveillance, a worldwide panopticon, but also the possibility of subversion because of the use of social media and the subversive effect of social media and of uh, the use of a simple mobile phone for uploading information uh, or events as soon as they happen. So there are many thinkers uh, who uh, also look at the possibilities of social media, not only to spread falsehood, which it does in good measure, but also the possibility of undermining the monopolistic control of mass media. And in that sense, there are, as I said, both hope for pessimism and optimism, and it will vary from uh, region to region and from time to time. Uh, the other point about the uh, system of education, as uh, Professor Williams mentioned, is this search for what he has called, uh, you know, raising the profile uh, to build status and ranking rather than uh, capacity. Now, uh, this is now a much more competitive system than it used to be, but uh, the possibilities exist today of undermining the role of the education system as merely a, a sort of a, a transmission chain because uh, anything anybody can say in a classroom can constantly be checked against uh, other sources of information that are available on the net. So there is a lot of criticism of the dumbing down of education because of the uh, decline in writing skills, in the uh, importance of online information, and the, uh, the shortening of the attention span of students and of the, uh, the lack of uh, uh, compatibility between the present ways of accessing knowledge and information and outmoded systems of evaluation of the performance of students. However, the point is that uh, in some ways, the new technology uh, opens up vast opportunities for accessing information from a variety of sources, which would not have been available merely 10 to 20 years ago. So the access to online journals, to databases, to uh, uh, other less reliable uh, sources uh, enables uh, somebody in a classroom to point out the tremendous importance of critical evaluation of data that is given. So I think nothing like falsehood to create a greater sense of the need for verification and cross-checking because there is so much that the ordinary student uh, would know to be false from his own experience. The possibility of trying to convince him that there are very stringent criteria that should be used to shift, uh, to shift information is something that is much easier to communicate than at a time when there was such tremendous respect for the, uh, you know, the educator, the teacher, the guru, uh, and uh, the learned man. So uh, while uh, there can be some uh, rather zany forms of rejection of authority, the attitude of critical attention to material that they get is much easier to communicate today in the classroom than would have been possible, I think, 10 to 20 years ago. So there is hope that in the global village, the person with the biggest advertising budget doesn't necessarily carry the day. Uh, we have uh, many studies of uh, COVID-19, uh, uh, which have uh, looked at the way in which different societies have tried to grapple with the problem. 
Uh, in one of the studies, it was pointed out that uh, you know uh, the Chinese uh, not only have a very uh, authoritarian form of government, which can impose a lockdown on several million people and carry it off. Uh, the, one of the studies uh, has pointed out that there was a huge amount of voluntary uh, uh, contributions by civil society in China on a considerable scale, running into uh, something like uh, you know eight to nine million people uh, who uh, were involved in uh, volunteering uh, work. Uh, and that uh, is a tremendous uh, achievement. On the other hand, uh, a much smaller country like South Korea uh, was one in which it is argued that there was a lot of civil society participation, but in much greater harmony with the state, unlike in China, where the state was often seen in a much more negative light. So that in Korea, uh, they were able to get uh, the two civil society and state actors to collaborate and therefore it was possible for them to uh, maintain livelihood uh, even while ensuring that the spread of infection was controlled because of the fact that they didn't have to shut down all their enterprises in quite the severe way that happened in some parts of China uh, and uh, in many parts of India and many parts of the world where this idea of a total lockdown was imposed. So there is hope in the fact that civil society uh, can play a role. There are national peculiarities. Japan has a strong tradition of uh, civil society uh, activity at times of a flood or earthquake. But in this study, it was reported that the response in Japan with regard to this was less impressive given its past track record because a lot of Japanese did not know how to respond to a respiratory disease, which was unfamiliar. Uh, and the Chinese response, quite apart from the fact that they have uh, no need to bother about public opinion, is also that they had a previous experience of dealing with SARS and building hospitals at very short notice. So there is optimism uh, and scope for optimism in the world uh, today. However, uh, there is a great need for all the countries to uh, increase uh, their budgets for education and health because uh, the tremendous negative consequences of COVID-19 were significantly amplified because of the inadequacy of the earlier systems, which couldn't cope with the enormous burden uh, imposed by COVID-19. Uh, please tell me how much time I have. If you could wind up in a minute or two, that would be yes, yes, wonderful. Yes, yeah, yeah. So the other point is that uh, you know, in uh, uh, countries like uh, South Africa, and particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, what is happening is, according to the uh, UN studies, is that uh, their uh, population is aging fast. And because of rapid urbanization, they are acquiring the illnesses of the affluent uh, people in the first world. Uh, it has been reported that in the African cities, if you move from the rural to the urban areas, the chances of getting uh, hypertension and diabetes go up from 1.5 to four times than if you had stayed behind in the rural areas. So we need to be able to manage urbanization in a more systematic manner, which is very crucial in order to reduce the burden on the state with regard to public health. But of course, there is no option but to increase uh, the funds allocated for education and health. 
I would just like to conclude by pointing out that it is only by a combination of enormous investment in uh, health and education that something like a sustainable economy can be built because the economy is to be built in the interests of the majority of people, not simply to preserve the environment. Of course, you cannot help the people without preserving the environment, but their livelihoods uh, cannot be treated lightly and uh, ignored in any such discussion. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Wan Xu, for sharing with us your insight on the surviving in global village today, using many uh, sharing many aspects um, that is at stake, uh, health and education, urbanization, uh, state support on those issues, sustainability of people that should come first. Thank you very much. So next, I would like to welcome Mr. Edward Levinson, who is award-winning photographer, short filmmaker and uh, essayist and poet. Mr. Levinson, over to you. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes. we can. Okay, and uh, maybe you need to take down your screen share. Thank you, okay. Uh, hello, everyone. It's very nice to be here today. Um, my talk is rather analog. It's on a piece of paper, not on a screen or a... Um, iPad or something like that. I wanted to uh, share a couple of things with you. Just let me make this a little bit smaller. Just a okay. Um, the theme, of course, surviving in a global village. Um, my talk will be a little bit different from our two previous esteemed professors, which were both very interesting. I made quite a lot of notes. Uh, today, I'd like to talk about the importance of feeling the global connection to the whole, even when you are just a small dot in a village. How does one maintain a certain awareness or a certain mindfulness to keep connected? How do we survive as individuals? And how does that connect to global survival? Now, we have our idealistic desires, and we have reality, which have both been covered by the previous speakers quite well. So, you know, our, what, how do we really want the world to be, how the world really is, and where is that middle point? How do we reconcile the ide idealistic desires that we have with the reality that is upon us? And so, uh, elegantly described by the two previous professors. A couple of questions I would just like to throw out uh, to how you connect to the global village. Uh, do you meditate and or do you pray? Is that something that you do? Do you do something practical like volunteer work? Could be anything. Um, do, you, do you take care with what you buy and what you throw away and what you recycle? Of course, these are the most basic things that we can do. So it's a combination of both the esoteric things and the mundane things, the philosophical and the practical. So I'm going to say that philosophical and practical, esoteric and mundane, mundane equal what is usually called holistic. Uh, pop, saying a pop, that was popular a few years ago, it probably is still popular, uh, maybe more than a few years ago, went something like this, think global, act local. Think global and act local. This was a big catchphrase back in the, maybe even, it was way back into the uh, 90s, could all even be going back to the 1980s when first Earth Day was, uh, you know, happening. But I'd like to ask just a simple, a few simple images. For example, if you buy a bottle of water at a convenience store, can you send that, can you send a thought to the child or the woman who is carrying water on their back or their head in an undeveloped country? 
Do you reuse the water bottle that you bought at the, at the convenience store several times before you recycle it? Another point, does your heart sometimes tell you to just get on a plane and go to Ukraine or go to Africa, go to Jerusalem uh, and try to do something good physically? Or you, do you sometimes just want to close your eyes and ears and forget about it all? Again, these are two basic needs. Or to put it another way, how do we balance the outer world with our inner world, finding a balance between these two, in my opinion, is a really important survival technique in our modern day global village. So now I'd like to start my uh, I have a PowerPoint presentation as it's been described in my biography. I am a photographer, so it's kind of a shame not to show some photos and include that as part of my presentation. So hopefully it will work. Let me, I've rehearsed several times. Let me see if I can get it going. Okay. Minute. Screen and thing. Okay, can everybody see the screen share? And I think you can move your little black box make it a little bit smaller yourself so that you can see my screen to its fullest. There should be an adjustment somewhere on your computers uh, where, you, where the little black uh, grid line is not perhaps blocking the photo. So, um, Whisper of the Land happens to be the name of uh, one of my books. And I'd just like to talk a little bit about what that means. Oops. Oh, sorry, my slide's not, oh, there it goes, okay. So, toward the one, united with all. Uh, this happens to also be the photo from the cover of my book. Um, just because, again, to stick to our theme, uh, we are very, uh, this is a very simple survival technique for surviving in a global village. So, you just, you're one person and you are keeping this thought in your mind toward the one united with all. Whisper of the land. Um, wh what does this mean? Whisper means it's a quiet voice, a breath, something special, but private, universal. Okay, so that is, again, connecting the individual with the global, uh, which would be, of course, the land, earth, country, planet, and unity. Uh, just a quick, so you know where I'm coming from, and so you can imagine uh, uh, Mukesh Williams, Mr. Dr. Williams was speaking about the Satoyama. I happen to live in the middle of the Satoyama, um, you can, the aerial, a couple of aerial views of my house. And I don't live on a hill that's this high. This was taken with a drone, but I just, uh, this is my spot in the global village and where I'm hoping and trying to live as sustainably and ecologically as possible while being rooted in the global village. That means I keep my, this is another one of my favorite phrases. I didn't invent it, feet on the ground, head in the sky. So your feet on the ground is local, your spot in the global community and your head in the sky is the way you approach the global village and you feel your uh, connection to the universe, to humanity, to the problems of the world, to the cry of the humanity, as it has also been called. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit, wait, I have some notes for this one, yes. I'd like to, I'd like to talk a little bit about the four elements and how to use them as a way to connect to the global village. Um, so these are practical. Uh, I usually would do this in a more meditative uh, style of presentation, but today I'm going to do it as a balance of practical and philosophical, I hope. So this would be representative of earth. And the two points I came up with were, earth keeps you grounded in reality 
while giving you energy. And one practice that you might try thinking about the earth, imagine walking in someone else's shoes. That's an old uh, Native American saying, you haven't walked until you've walked a mile in so-and-so's moccasins. So, of course, some people don't even have a pair of shoes to wear. So that's another uh, way that we can connect and feel and then maybe find some uh, positive aspects as well of the universe, uh, global village. Water, the thoughts that came to me with looking at these slides, just a few. Water, it very easily crosses the boundaries. Water, it breaks down battery, a boundary, uh, it bakes, sorry, let's try it. Water, very easily crosses borders. It breaks down boundaries. And this is interesting. Water produces a universal sound. And also on a practical viewpoint, as I told you, I'm living in the countryside. I'm collecting rainwater in my tanks and using them for my daily life. I use a waterless toilet, composting toilet. So these are connected to the practical. Fire, fire, next page, sorry, fire. One of the basic needs for cooking and eating, doesn't matter if you're poor or rich, you need lights, you need heat to cook your food, to live, um, but it can also symbolize anger, uh, what's sometimes called, in, in, at least in American English, uh, righteous indignation which I thought might be a difficult word for the Japanese. So it's something like Sioku ikario kanjiru, righteous indignation. You just get very angry at the world. And this is where the fire element comes, uh, comes in handy, I would say. Um, but the fire can also represent one's ego. So the, 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 uh, the point, the key, the balance point, is to try to convert this fire, this ego, or whatever you want to call it, or your anger, you convert it into light, something that is positive. We want to stand up for the truth, and this is uh, some of the images that I prefer for that. Clouds, air, earth, ah, sorry, air and the wind, and we'll just let this one also carry us into the element of the spirit. Um, this one is very important for me to feeling the global village. I live in the countryside, rather isolated place. Like sometimes I go a few days without going out to even the little village where I live, to the town where I live. And I'm located, I'm standing on my spot on the hill. But my little secret, one of my everyday practices is just to put my thoughts on a cloud and let them spread out to the world. And it, it eases my uh, worries, but it also helps me offer something of myself and of my being, hopefully, to the planet. Okay. I just want to say that I know most of you probably don't live in this uh, nature or are surrounded very closely by nature. I just, these are three images taken in Tokyo one of the biggest cities in the world. But even when I'm in Tokyo, I managed to find my little oasises of nature, which helped me to connect to, well, to connect to humanity and feel the global village. So again, taken in Ropungi and in the middle of, uh, the one with the sun on the bottom was taken in the middle of Gin, uh, Ginza Skiabashi crossing, just about this time of year, the summer solstice. Okay, uh, as you may, some of you may know, I also write haiku as well as being a photographer. Uh, what do you do when you become overwhelmed? I have to admit that I heard a little bit of a feeling of, there were so many, a lot of positive comments in our, in our previous speakers' talks, which I'm greatly appreciate, but I have, I have a sense they, that they both feel also a little bit overwhelmed with the situation of the world. Uh, this is a haiku that I wrote one morning as I sat doing my um, meditation. 
bird song, worry is gone, fly away. Now this doesn't mean that we leave the world and go live like the guru on the mountaintop. It just means that we take a break and we listen to the bird song or we smell the roses as the popular saying goes, and then we get back to work. And one more haiku. Um, this is also uh, inspired during my morning meditation hours, uh, not hours, morning meditation time. North wind touches my shoulder, awakening dreams. North wind touches my shoulder, awakening dreams. So again, this is another way to, you have your inner dream, but you're using the element of the wind or maybe it'd be the, one of the previous ones, the water or the sky or the earth or the fire. You have your dreams and you use the power of those elements to help you along. You don't have to make it a public scene. Uh, it's just a part of your inner being. And then as you go about your daily activities, teaching, taking care of your children, shopping and talking to the people in the supermarket, uh, your car mechanic, whatever, you can spread that and connect to the global village. We just changed, speaking of the global village, we'll just change the mood here for a minute. Um, this is in Belarus near Chernobyl, taken in 1992. Uh, this is what I'd looked like uh, 30 years ago. And this, uh, my wife and I, we did some pro uh, homestay projects where we hosted uh, children from Chernobyl, from the contaminated Chernobyl area who had come to Japan to, for a healthy homestay. The idea was that their immune systems would get strengthened by living in a good environment for one month and eating good food and just having a stress-free life. These three boys, this picture was when I was, is when I went to visit my three sons who were, uh, they had come to visit me in Japan. And in this, at this time in my life, I was, well, I was mostly a photojournalist. I worked, did magazine work. I didn't do, I didn't cover wars and things like that, but it was sort of my goal to be a photojournalist. And I wondered uh, for a while, is this the way I should go? Shall I be a photojournalist and help the world that way? or should I do something else? And what I decided eventually was that I do do some photojournalistic work, but I also decided, found out, discovered that my own artwork would be, had become documentary in itself. And that by doing my art and taking pictures of, uh, quote, beautiful and sometimes controversial things that I was able to uh, do more than working for a newspaper or a magazine, although I did that for many years as well. So this is, I just wanna take one more look. This is 1992. This is nine, tw 2022. I'm not sure if you can realize what this is, but these days I'm doing a little bit of, uh, sometimes I do some part-time working as a model. Now this is a very, I put this slide in there, not to show off my model modeling skills, but because the concept of this photo shoot was a global family. If you look at the people of me in the center, the lady on the right, she's, I think she's Japanese. She's not my wife. As you have a Japanese couple, the children are mixed, mixed uh, race, ethnicity children. And this was the look, this was the idea of the fashion brand and what he wanted. And the reason that he wanted this was because their brand, um, they some of their a lot of their clothes are made in Africa, and you can see the influence of the African designs on their print. And they they uh, have a they have women working for them who couldn't get a job elsewhere. They have disabled people making the, helping make their clothes, and they also run an MPO organization, which is making uh, running uh, giving uh, materials to schools and school lunches. This is in Ghana. I'm pretty sure it's in Ghana. Uh, if you're interested, you can look. It's called Cloudy Tokyo. Cloudy Tokyo. 
but I just wanted to throw that photo in. A couple more and we're almost done. Uh, this is obviously me. I live near the ocean. There's a saying, there's a saying, it's often said that our lives are but a drop in the ocean. Our lives are but a drop in the ocean. But when one drop moves, the whole ocean moves. When one drop moves, the whole ocean moves. I also include this photo in my slideshow because of course it has all the elements in it, earth, water, fire, and spirit. And I'm right there in the water taking the picture. Now we come to the last slide. Although it's the very end of spring, uh, in just a few days it will be officially summer, I think. This is a haiku that was inspired by the spring sunset, but the photo, to be truthful, is actually in the fall. And well, this is my thing that I just want to leave you with is to try to be the, the balloon on fire and to let your light go out. And when you need to, you float freely. And when you need to be a balloon on fire, you become a balloon on fire. So that ends my talk. Thank you very much, Mr. Levinson, for your wonderful talk. It was very refreshing to see such a beautiful pictures with your talk, uh, you. of course, your poem too. And it was very important for, for me personally also to understand, um, I mean, to have your talk in addition to wonderful analysis that were made previously from um, two professors, how, um, how we should be aware of an individual um, about the, the connection with the global village or with the nature or with, uh, with the surroundings. So thank you very much for sharing the practical examples of how you uh, how you personally do that through your wonderful poems and pictures. Thank you. Thank you. So we'd like to move on to Q and A session, and these three wonderful panelists have have shared with us such a vast areas for discussion. And I'm very sure that the audience have many things to uh, to uh, to discuss about. So please feel free to type in the comments or question in the chat box. Or if you would prefer, it is also uh, 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 we would like to welcome people to unmute yourself and uh, st um, share with us your idea briefly. Um, we have about half an hour. For this Q&A session. So I think while we're waiting for comments from the audience, perhaps um, we comment. could. Yes, we I could can make a comment um, to get to warm up the people. Uh, uh, Dr. Williams' uh, speech. I, was, I made a few notes. I loved your opening remark. I'm still alive. Uh, that's something that we should all think about every day. We are still alive, um, bottoms up, and we do sometimes need to reinvent invent ourselves. You talked about removing the mask. I just suddenly that just became sort of a symbolic thing to me, you know, because sometimes before Corona or COVID, everybody nobody wore a mask. And you saw their face, but now everybody kind of hiding behind their mask and. I wonder what's going to happen. Can you re can they still show themselves after taking off their mask? Uh, and uh, one other comment, just on the practical thing about the you were talking about the Satoyama. I know you live in Hachijoji, where there's a lot of countryside. Yes, I'm very aware, as you can see where I live. Um, unfortunately, I don't like. I hate to be negative, but unfortunately, it's not. It, it, it seems to be going. A lot of people are sort of abandoning the Satoyama in a way. I mean because for one reason, the older population and the younger people are just not 
that into it. So there are a lot of the rice paddies and some of the forest very close to my house are now uh, unattended and growing wild unless myself or some volunteer comes and cuts the grass and rakes it up. Even 20, even 30 years ago, when I was growing, tried to grow rice and uh, an old farmer who I knew had some cows. And I said, oh, aren't you gonna bring your cow manure over here and spread it on the rice field? He said, no, no, that's, we don't have time for that. It's too much trouble and we don't have time. And he's putting his chemical fertilizers. This was already 30 years ago. Now I think there is some getting back to it. And I've been living in the Satyama now for 30 years, but there's people who have arrived here like 10 years ago, five years ago, two years ago, people half my age who are really into it and trying to do the, make example of doing the sustainable life. And I, to me, that's a very positive uh, thing. I don't want to, I could say more, but I don't want, let's maybe someone else has something to say. <laughs> Professor Williams. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I loved uh, Ed's uh, presentation. It was really fantastic. It really uh, opened up so many spaces, difficult to explain. But undoubtedly, he's so very connected to the world that he lives in. And that is the key. That is the key to sustainability. That is the key to living in a global village. And there was a time <clears throat> when people wanted to go to the city and they used to complain, you are living in a, in a rural area. What kind of place is this? <clears throat> uh, it's Inaka, Inaka is a rural place. And they looked down upon me. <clears throat> now these very people are the ones who want to come and stay where I stay. Is there some property here? So how the world has changed? People don't like to live in areas which are contaminated. <clears throat> so, and yes, what Ed said is, is, is true, that when I came here about 25 years ago, people were abandoning their <clears throat> farms. But now I see there's a guy I know, he grows peaches and he collects all the leaves and makes these narrow channels where he places all the <clears throat> leaves in it, uh, about uh, two meters deep and his peaches are really coming very nice. I too do it. And all the fruits are really doing very well, including, you know, peels of uh, bananas and all kinds of things. I, I don't buy mm, synthetic uh, manure anymore, <clears throat> fertilizers. They're doing very well. And as I said, that I have connected all the <clears throat> plants that I have uh, nicely so that I don't water them and they are also growing really wonderfully well. <clears throat> so I think there is, and uh, people are buying more from local shops. I have the shiitake guy who sells shiitake very close to my house. I go there regularly to pick up shiitake. He sells it for 500 yen, but I want to support him. Uh, he sells uh, dry shiitake. He sell, sells um, fresh shiitake, which is mushroom, high quality mushroom. And I go there to buy and he's very happy, very happy to see that uh, as a foreigner, I go and buy regularly from, from him. <clears throat> so things like this, which we never thought, but we are beginning to think. So this is what I want to say. And the haikus are really wonderful. I also write and I love them the way you express. <clears throat> and they really make meaning. <clears throat> Sometimes the photograph and the haiku together capture the essence. It's kind Thank of, a, it's kind of yep. a debate. Should you, should you put a photo with your haiku or leave it? Just as I could. I was just listening to a lecture the other day, and that was kind of like a mm, yes or no. But uh, sometimes it works. It works yeah. very well. well sometimes I, I it do works. it. I have yeah. a whole book. With, mm -hmm. You know, I have quite a few books, but 
if I could just make one more comment about, uh, I thought uh, that Dr. Wanchu's uh, one thing that one sentence that stuck in my mind was about how capital money moves so quickly with the touch of a mouse. And it's true. And how the movement, well, I'm not exact, but I think this is what he meant, that the movement of people themselves, though it is necessary, is so slow. The immigration and holding people up at the borders. And we are happy to send money in a fraction of a second, but we are not so happy to let people cross the borders. And that was sort of a, this is a thought that stuck with me. Yeah, I think Rohit was mentioning about his inability to go to Cambridge now because of the high cost. But uh, nevertheless, he can buy lots of goods on Amazon. <clears throat> lots of what? Lots of things from Amazon. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, uh, your your perspective was more historical and uh, you also, I also caught that uh, the subversive effect and the restraint and how capital moves freely. Undoubtedly, this is uh, much discussed uh, by many uh, Appadurai and many other people. Uh, it definitely, it's, it's a phenomena. But uh, what has taken place in recent times uh, is, is much more complex I think, and I'm sure you <clears throat> are aware, uh, many more new things have come about, especially you mentioned about the supply chains and the production. The supply chains are very important in Japan and how they were disrupted and how they are not restored, but new supply chains or parallel supply chains are now emerging. So that will take a long debate, but uh, Haruka-san, he is an economist. He I work for him for Japan Spotlight and mm -hmm. he he mentioned and some of the things that we don't understand and uh, Professor Sharma is right here. He mentioned that the weakening of bonds, uh, the weakening of human communication is something that we will see more and more. So he mm -hmm. wants to say something. Good afternoon, everybody. I enjoyed the lecture of uh, Professor William, Professor Wan Chu, and uh, uh, that of uh, the third person. Edward. I enjoyed it. Yeah, Edward. <laughs> I was wondering if uh, you have touched uh, everything, but uh, one of the most important things in me is, uh, is the nature. We are all the creation of nature. And they have five elements, as uh, Professor Edward mentioned, air, earth, fire, water, and sky. And one more thing, you put all of them together, but it doesn't give you a life. So getting a life with the mobility, you need a spirit, you need a soul. And that soul is being provided by the nature. Now, if you go along with the nature in uh, uh, consonance with it, you are going to be a happy person. But what has happened that uh, the emotions, the connectivity with the people, emotionally and otherwise, we have lost uh, the families. If a child is in, uh, uh, in difficulty, or if a growing child is in difficulty, whom he is going to discuss, how to solve those very problems. And if he does not get it, he may be afraid. Maybe there is a possibility that the families are disturbed. So we have got the developed countries' uh, 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 difficulties, uh, that they are growing in depression. There is uh, uh, no communication between people. There is no faith between the people. So uh, the society is uh, that is changing so much. I feel that if we connect with the nature and uh, we follow the nature, that is whatever you have taken it from them, give it back to them. But what we are doing, we are getting them, but we are inspiring them. 
And the most important thing which worries me is the production of energy. We have different types of energies. And Japan knows the effect of them, the atomic energy. Today, we are on the threshold of another explosion. And do you imagine that we have evolved a system where the energy can be produced, but we do not have a system to control it for our benefits. So what will happen? If any insane person again thinks of detonating or uh, avenging uh, the people, then what will happen? The whole world will destroy. What will be left with? Nothing. So we also should think how to connect people. If you are emotionally connected, you will feel them. If you are not emotionally connected, you will not feel them. If before me somebody is suffering, and if it pinches me, then you are along with the nature. If it does not, then you are just a mechanical person. That is the era of mecha mechanism. And that is what uh, is uh, given in the scriptures of our uh, religion. That the God created persons. God created everything. But he decided and uh, he desired the people are going to make use of them. That people are not going to misuse them. So since uh, Professor Edward is very close to nature, then I think that he should uh, tell people how to increase the beauty, utility of nature. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pro Professor Sharma, for your comment. In relation to his um, uh, his comment on nature, uh, there is one question from a student, Soka University, to uh, Mr. Edward. Uh, well, actually, there are two. Uh, one is that so uh, when uh, which which theme do you enjoy the most when you are taking picture of nature? That's one. Second is that. Uh, you shared with us pictures of global families and nature, and you shared with us the, the life in remote areas or in nature, in the midst of nature. And I suppose the student says uh, there is to a certain um, inconvenience in living in, um, in nature. So would you uh, would you tell us more about living in nature? So these sure. are two questions. We also have other questions to other professors, which I will share with you later. Okay, so but first. Okay, so Mr. first Levin. one was about taking my my taking pictures. Um, I I for me the the best part about taking the pictures is just being there and connecting with the subject that I'm taking. Um, it, uh, whether I go to the ocean and take a picture of the ocean and the rocks or whether I am in my own garden and take a picture of the flower, it's these moments um, that you are communing with these objects. If I'm in Ginza or Shinjuku or somewhere in Tokyo or in Europe or America, and I take a portrait or something of people, it's that time that you get to spend together with them. Most of the pictures I showed you today were not, not my trademark pinhole images. There were a couple, but they were more than uh, just ordinary color photos. But especially with my pinhole photography, it, it has a very slow exposure time, which means that I'm, it takes not a, a fraction of a second, but it takes five, 10, 15 seconds sometimes minutes to take one photo. And during that time, I am becoming one with my object. Um, I have my favorites, but they're all my favorites. Personally, speaking about the elements, each one of us has one, usually two elements that are main in, in your personality or the way you act. For me, it's earth and fire. So the ones that are more difficult for me 
uh, water, water and air. I have to work harder to connect with those, but earth and fire are very easy for me. So maybe that also reflects my uh, photography. Uh, the, the problems of uh, living in the countries that know it's not easy. Um, I make a joke that it's a never ending story. There's always something to do, something to pull some weeds or uh, do I have enough water? I'm not connected to the public water. Do I have enough water? I have solar panels, but do I have enough electricity? Um, you know, just to go shopping, you do have to get in your car. It's a little too far to ride a bike or walk to go shopping. Um, but the saving grace for me is that I have this, you know, space around me that I can, I mean, basically I can retreat from the world, but still be participate in the world. And I was gonna say this later, but I'll just add it now in case I don't have time to speak later. I have this one image that came to me one day when I was doing my, uh, uh, what I call my meditation practice. I try to do it outside, standing under my favorite cherry tree. And one day, I'm, sometimes I stand there and I, well, I wonder, is this really doing anything? Is it doing anything to me? Is it doing anything for the planet? And one morning I was there and I just, suddenly I had this feeling that I was like a, a totem pole. I don't know if you know what a totem pole is, but it's the Native Americans, they have a pole and they put it in a sacred spot. It could be anywhere in any country. I'm sure India and Japan have similar things. Or to make it even more practical, uh, uh, acupuncture needle, where someone sticks a needle in you to heal you. Well, this one particular morning I thought, Oh yes, I'm a, like I'm like an acupuncture needle stuck into the earth, and hopefully I'm hitting the right point, and hopefully the, um, that I will maybe heal the planet. And this is not to be egotistical or anything. It just gives me hope to think this. It gives me hope for for the planet, and so it also encourages me to keep doing it every day, even if it's sometimes hard to see the results. Okay, so I think, I'm not sure, I, I think, I hope I answered your question. Thank you very much. Okay. I have another question to Professor Rohit Banchu about uh, the, your talk on te new technology and education in India. Um, this, this, uh, this student asked about how new technology um, can can help the poor in India who do not have who do not have access to education. Uh, this is from Japanese student. Uh, there are two ways to answer this question. One is that do people have access to a mobile phone with a connection? And a lot of people do. So in fact, there was even a commercial where you know the people were trying to show that they could have a class in a remote area using a telephone to communicate and deliver a lecture or to have some sort of communication. The other issue is about access to data sources and journals for more advanced level learners. Uh, here, the, the digital divide is important, and even in Delhi University during COVID, there were problems about access to the internet. And uh, you know, I mean, in a home, if even if there is one person with a laptop, but there are two or three people who need to use it, then there is a question of the time and access to this technology. So, uh, you know, one is a basic level where it can work for millions. And then there is the other more advanced level where there will be more practical difficulties, particularly where lectures of a more advanced kind and particularly those which require complex ideas to be put across or representations and diagrams to be, uh, you know, uh, explained. There it will be difficult. 
And certainly for mathematics, it'll be very difficult. Yes, thank you, sir. Um, there is another question. Uh, this, this is a question about uh, how Indian government um, implemented policies to, uh, to help people. This student asks, is asking that uh, whether during the, uh, during the COVID-19, um, what was the reaction? I mean, what was the policies that were implemented by the central government to uh, to support those who could not access to uh, food and uh, health care? And if there were any uh, civil society supports, let it be a religious community or let it be other um, other association in India. So. COVID-19 yes, and yes. social exclusion, inclusion, please. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, you know, now, now clearly, uh, there, there, there are some, there are some uh, achievements and there are some uh, weaknesses. The weakness or the unanticipated uh, uh, ill uh, effect was that the lockdown resulted in uh, many people uh, being asked to leave uh, because the jobs had ended and there were a lot of people, migrant workers who had to go back home in difficult conditions. But the government provided food on a very extensive basis to millions of people. And these were delivered by the government agencies, including the police coming in at various places and by members of civil society by religious organizations, by the Gurudwaras, by uh, many organizations, uh, including volunteer groups in many parts of the country. So as far as the supply of basic food is concerned, uh, it was very largely met. So uh, people were not affected uh, in terms of starvation, which would have been one of the consequences if the delivery system had been absent or weak. The health system uh, faced a lot of problems, uh, but uh, after the worst was over, uh, there was a substantial improvement in the supply so that eventually India was able to produce vaccines which is supplied to different countries of the world, including Brazil where there was a very interesting image, which might interest uh, uh, you know, Mr. Edward Levinson, is that of Hanuman carrying uh, you know, the medicine to Brazil uh, and so on. And that uh, was a very powerful image of the way in which uh, India uh, was uh, the world's major supplier of vaccines including to poor countries which would not have afforded those vaccines. So the WHO complained about the fact that the rich countries were not sharing many of the vaccines because they were too expensive or they didn't have enough of them. But India supplied them for a considerable period of time to enormous uh, you know, population outside the country. So I think uh, within the uh, resources that are available in the country, both in terms of uh, the medical infrastructure and in terms of financial resources, the effort was quite creditable and uh, should be uh, recognized as was done by several Western agencies, something that they don't do very often. Uh, and uh, I think it is uh, worth recording. Yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Wanchu. Uh, we have one more questions to uh, one more question to Professor uh, Mukesh Williams. Um, you had mentioned about the sustainable urban life in um, mainly in Tokyo. Uh, what I mean, since you have lived in uh, both in Tokyo and uh, Delhi for a long time, um, what do you see the challenges of uh, Tokyo particularly today? Uh, 
to um, to um, to have the sense of global uh, community or global village to make the city a surviving global village yeah thank you for the for the question there were many things that i could not say because there was no time but uh, definitely there is a great uh, consciousness both in the government and in the local agencies to make tokyo sustainable and not only that even the companies like toyota <clears throat> uh, they are very keen to make uh, tokyo sustainable <clears throat> and i mentioned to you the hydrogen project i mentioned to you the recycle projects that are there and all these things emerged out of <clears throat> the olympics there was no reason for it to happen and yet the government pushed it so that in the midst of difficult times to be able to create a sustainable environment and come up with new technology was very very important there were problems as well but uh, the kind of global village that was created for the olympics like in the form of a tree and so on all those things were there the design the cost plus plus the new technologies and connecting life with nature was really really phenomenal and the great thing is it's not just a people's movement it was very deeply connected with the push by the government and they were very keen that this is the message they want to give to the world that even in the midst of all these problems japan could hold the olympics and employ reusable strategies eco-friendly reusable strategies that was absolutely marvelous <clears throat> and i wouldn't have known because most of the people withdrew emotionally from olympics and said yeah what a waste of time they shouldn't be doing it <clears throat> but because i was asked to write about it i interviewed people met with them and i began to feel that these very people wanted to make the lives of the participants really wonderful they left their homes and sang for them on the streets worked for them provided them with food <clears throat> and rice which uh, many people said was contaminated and they people ate and said look this is really wonderful he said nothing is contaminated these are just just kind of pr slogans and people went back very happy so basically the push was from all directions in tokyo and i think after that recently i think it has subsided a little bit because that enthusiasm is gone but i am sure it is going to pick up because right from 2014 you have a japanese co a car called mirai which is future which means <clears throat> and uh, that is a hydrogen car and since then a lot of new cars which were buses and so on driven by hydrogen water everything uh, there are three kinds of uh, hydrogen energy there's a very clean hydrogen energy that is being created i don't know how far we can go with it at the moment it is expensive but if this is the direction people are going into then tokyo will be undoubtedly be number one and not only tokyo but other countries are also using some of this technology i am given to believe that india was using some of this technology <clears throat> and and other countries were using so one is trying to mix new technology with new uh, new uh, incentives new desires new goals and aspirations because things have changed and to use them effectively to to recharge society and i think it is very necessary for for a, a country like japan that they come uh, into what is called renewable sources of energy because things are not very good 
And unless they think in a new way, they cannot survive. So it's a matter of survival. And uh, to create beds out of, uh, uh, out of uh, hardboard paper or cardboard paper is something fantastic, though it is expensive at this time, but uh, I'm sure that, and I'm given to believe that such uh, technology will create goods that will last for a long time. If that is so, then uh, it is going to create a new movement in society. And we have phenomenal technology. So I think poorer countries should take this technology and use it to reimagine their social systems. That's what I want to say. Thank you very much, Professor William. Um, this is the this is the this is the all question that we have. So I think we should end this symposium here. We have wonderful wonderful speakers today with us, and thank you. I'd like to thank all of the panelists today to share their uh, to have shared their insights on the surviving global village. Thank you very much for your talk, and I hope all the participants here today have fully enjoyed. Unfortunately, we will end the session here, but thank you very much, everyone. We will have the SARC, South Asia Research Center at Soka University. We'll have other events, so please stay in touch and join the events, future events. Thank you very much again to Professor Rohit Wanchu, Mr. Edward Levinson and Professor Mukesh Williams for sharing your wonderful ideas. It gives us a lot of things to think about. Thank you so much. Thank you very much to the participants as well. Thank, Thank you, you so much.